Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Okay. Good morning, and welcome to Grand Rounds. We have a unique experience planned for you today and are grateful to our esteemed speaker who has traveled all the way from Copenhagen to be with us today. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Peter Kergaard. Dr. Kergaard is a director of the Natural History Museum of Denmark and a professor of evolutionary history at the University of Copenhagen since 2015. He has led an unparalleled turnaround of the Natural History Museum, leading to an increase in visitor numbers of 300%, with a marked growth in financial revenue and societal impact, while at the same time being responsible for one of the largest museum projects in Northern Europe with 30,000 square meter of new museum space in the Botanical Garden in central Copenhagen. Previously, he had a position as Professor of Evolutionary Studies and Director of the Center for Biocultural History at RS University. In this position, he was part of launching a new master's program in heritage studies and played a central role in new Mosgard Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. He has held a series of fellowships at leading universities in Britain, France, and the United States, including Oxford University, University of Cambridge, Ecole Normale Supérieure Paris, Harvard University, and University of California, Los Angeles. Forgive my pronunciation. <laughs> His research focuses on natural history, cultural heritage, human history and evolution, public understanding of science, and history of science, anthropology, and archaeology. He has a strong record of leadership and has received several major national and international grants and awards. He is a fellow of the Linnaean Society of London. He is currently writing a book for a major Danish publishing house of our shared roots of humanity based on his own travels to unique archaeological and paleontological sites. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kiergaard. Thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction. Um, and uh, I'd also say that I'm delighted to be here. I've tried a um, lot of things in my life, but I have never, ever spoken at a hospital before to an audience and medical doctors. So this is indeed a great honor for, for me to, to be here today. Um, also, uh, since you are an expert audience, but a different kind of an expert audience that I talk to. Uh, I am uh, in combination with the fact that I've just finished a book. Uh, and this is the first time that I'm talking about it. So I feel like an undergraduate standing for doing his first, uh, first presentation uh, ever. Anyway, I will take you through a journey uh, around the world to some places that has some significance for our understanding of our big evolutionary history. It's a history that goes back 7 million years. So within the next four to five minutes, you'll be traveling through time, 7 million years, and all over the world, except as you can see, uh, Europe and, uh, and, and, most of, uh, and most of Asia. I was Beginning my uh, museum career at uh, um, building, being part of uh, a large project for building a new museum for anthropology and archaeology uh, at Aarhus, uh, the new Mosgard Museum. Absolutely beautiful uh, architecture built into the hill, uh, wonderful museums. And I had the pleasure of working with these two dots. Uh, twins, as you see on the, in the bottom uh, corner, they are paleo uh, artists. Uh, so they are working on, the, on fossils to recreate, um, especially humans, uh, early humans, um, different species of, uh, of humans. So in my talk, I will give you some, you'll be meeting some individuals that I've been working with, these two uh, wonderful uh, artists uh, that we use for an exhibition on the stairs leading down into the exhibitions at, uh, at, this, uh, at this museum. Um, though some of the characters that you'll meet, they, uh, they look like this. You'll be, you'll be seeing them shortly. But before we go, return to that, uh, let me just give you 
a super brief introduction to human evolution. Uh, you are, I'm sure, all familiar with the Charles Darwin seminal work, The Origin of Species, uh, published in 1859 where he spoke very little about uh, humans. He it took him another 12 years to build the evidence, muster the courage to speak more openly about, uh, about uh, humans. And in Darwin's work, The Descent of Man, there are four key components uh, to human evolution. Um, and that's basically the, the, uh, the, uh, the large, the big narrative of, uh, of our evolutionary story. It's down from the trees, up on two legs, growing a big rain, and uh, starting civilization. Our understanding today is slightly more complicated, but these are still some of the key elements that, uh, that we, are, we are looking at. Uh, at the time of uh, the publication of uh, The Descent of Man, uh, only two different species were known to, uh, to Darwin and his contemporaries, uh, human, humans like us, Homo sapiens, and Neanderthals that were discovered in 1856. And uh, at the time uh, of uh, the publication of Descent of Man in, the, in 1871, it was recognized as another human species. But today we have quite a different picture. Uh, this is one recent example of uh, trying to build our evolutionary family tree Currently, most of us, we agree that uh, there have been about 25 different species of, uh, of humans. I think maybe we have 23 species uh, up, uh, up here, but there's only one left, ourselves, Homo sapiens. Uh, all the rest of them have, uh, have gone in extinct. The first humans that, uh, that, we, that we, at least we know of, is uh, Sanlanthropus chadensis, discovered in uh, the in Chad in uh, in the desert, and it, is, it was about six to seven million uh, years uh, years old, which aligns very well to the uh, to the time when we our human family went in the, in one direction and uh, the. And chimpanzees and bonobos went in the, in, on another evolutionary tra tra trajectory. So the Sanlanthropus chadensis uh, that uh, you see here at the very bottom of our, or the base of our uh, evolutionary tree has just it's just about the same time when we split when our uh, branch split from uh, human uh, from chimpanzees and uh, and bonobos. All the rest of it very complicated story. We'll not go through all the details today, uh, but. Uh, uh, I want to just say uh, we tried at our uh, museum in Copenhagen, the Natural History Museum, in, a, in an exhibit of uh, Neanderthals to see what happens if you are showing at least some of them. So here are some of, the, some of these characters, 10 out of 15. It was a bit of an experiment for, for us. It was an exhibition on Neanderthals, but when we, in the last room, we wanted to introduce uh, the audience. Here we are building it. Uh, to that message that there used to be 25 human species and now there's only one. How would people react? And I, th I thought this would be very nerdy. Nobody really liked it, but it seemed it, it turned out to be the most popular room, even uh, populated by that interesting subspecies uh, of gastroenterologists. <laughs> and they. Here you also see an example, one of our, uh, one of our superpowers uh, as, uh, as human, humans, that we connect, we are building very strong social ties through our interactions with, uh, with others. Oops, sorry. Here's Anna. And this is me doing an anthropological experiment. I'm, I'm observing you, and I was interested to see how would medical doctors react to this image. I've shown this image. It's my, my niece. She's just a few months uh, old. She's lying safely on the father's uh, arm. And I've shown this to museum audiences. I've shown this to students. I've shown this to teenagers. Uh, I've shown this to, uh, to uh, a group of elderly people. And this, the, the reaction is exactly the same as in most of you, this, it brings a smile on your face. And this is 
our, one of our superpowers as, uh, as humans, that we connect to people, we react to, uh, to people, uh, even though we don't know them, even though we've see, we're seeing them for the first time, and especially we uh, connect to young children, which is incredibly fortunate. And if we didn't, we wouldn't be here today. Empathy is, uh, is really what, uh, what has made us uh, survive. Anna is absolutely unable to, uh, to take care of herself. Uh, no human baby is able to take care of uh, itself. And by that, we, and it's that wonderful, expensive, big brain of ours that takes up about 20% of all the energy that we uh, consume in a baby. It takes up about 40% of all the energy that, uh, that we consume. It's incredibly expensive, it, it, and especially for newborns. It weighs a lot. It's complicated in all sorts of ways. And yet, uh, through empathy, we are creating a system that will make us careful uh, for our, our babies, and not just our own babies, but also the, your neighbor's baby. You, when you see a baby, you'll take care of it. Um, I'll take you to the first stop, and this is somehow connected. So the, this is uh, an example of our uh, closest living relatives. All the 20, 24 other spe human species that we're talking about, they've all gone extinct, which brings chimpanzees, makes that our closest living relatives. Uh, when we look at... Uh, Chimpanzees, there's a lot of things that we share with them. We share a lot of our genes. 98.7% of our genes are shared with them. But most importantly, and that goes back to our superpower, we can connect, we uh, share a lot of our uh, behavior, uh, behavioral traits uh, with chimpanzees. This is a group of chimpanzees in the Kimbali forest uh, that I've, uh, uh, me and my colleagues, we're following for an, an entire day. This is the end of the day. It's an uh, afternoon snack, very quiet, relaxed moment. We can all recognize that. We can relate to, uh, to situations like, uh, uh, like this. And then a lot of things when we study chimpanzees that are very relatable. For instance, they, uh, uh, young chimpanzees, they are using various props for toys. We have uh, expressions of, uh, of grief. Uh, we have a lot of the same kind of social bonding that uh, we see, uh, intergenerational bonding, uh, but also uh, and not just within families, uh, uh, within, the, within the group. We have very strong social hierarchies uh, and, with, and fights about hierarchies. We've got uh, um, all, the, all the elements that, uh, that we know from, uh, from human behavior are shared uh, in, uh, with, uh, with chimpanzees. We see a new study it was just out that uh, also uh, demonstrated that uh, that young chimpanzees they love to tease adults, uh, uh, and they do that in a very similar way to uh, to humans. When we look at uh, chimpanzees, when we look at not just chimpanzees but uh, primates, laughter, uh, and among the uh, among the the big apes, our laughter. Uh, the pattern, uh, the acoustic pattern of uh, laughter, of human laughter, compared to chimpanzee laughter, baroba laughter, gorilla laughter, and uh, orangutan laughter, uh, that when we map that, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the acoustic patterns on the genetics, uh, we can see that they follow exactly the same, uh, the same uh, path. So we can see from just the acoustic pattern of laughter in the chimpanzees or bonobos that they are uh, the closest related apes to, to us, gorillas a bit further off, and orangutans a bit uh, further off. So a lot of the things are shared with, uh, oops, with chimpanzees. And here is another image. This is a morning uh, session, uh, just after bre breakfast, hanging out, uh, having a bit of a, a, bit of a snack, uh, grooming each other. Again, very relatable, something that uh, uh, seemed could be uh, a Friday uh, evening with the family or friends hanging out on the sofa watching uh, your favorite David Attenborough uh, documentary. So 
when we look at and why are chimpanzees important for us when we all want to understand what uh, what makes us uh, what, what makes us human often people they think that they are very human like but what we actually see from and what we get from looking at chimpanzees is that we are seeing and studying and getting an understanding and an appreciation of the animal in uh, in humans and, uh, and not the humans in, uh, in, in the animals. And we can use them as a proxy for understanding some of, uh, some of the things that has gone, uh, been going on in early, uh, early human evolutionary uh, history. I'll now take you to uh, the second stop uh, in South Africa, in uh, Johannesburg, some, uh, in the area around Johannesburg, uh, an area, a UNESCO World Heritage Site called the uh, cradle of uh, humankind, where we have found an incredible amount of uh, fossils from uh, early uh, early humans, a lot of uh, very famous uh, fossil fossil sites, and uh, you see some examples uh, over there. You really have to know what uh, what to to look for. Um, all of these fossils are uh, collected in the vault at uh, the Witz uh, University in Johannesburg. Uh, it's well, the, probably it's the single room with the highest uh, amount and the highest concentration of, uh, of uh, um, fossils from, uh, from different humans, uh, human species. Uh, it's an incredible uh, collect collection. One of them right there in your, uh, in your right uh, corner uh, was discovered just about 100 years uh, ago, in 1924, uh, by a medical doctor, Raymond Dart, uh, who, was, who went to uh, Johannesburg to set up the new medical school. Uh, that was a tough job for him. Uh, and he had an, uh, a strong interest in, uh, in human evolution and in fossils. So uh, whenever there was a break, whenever there was a holiday for his students, he encouraged them to go out and look for fossils. Um, so one of uh, one of his uh, uh, students, um, a young medical student, her, his first um, female medical student, uh, she uh, was very enthusiastic about this fossil hunt, and she found at uh, one of her friends at the mantelpiece uh, of uh, of their home a skull of a fossil baboon. That came from one of uh, the limework quarries uh, in in the area, and that led R Raymond Dart to look for uh, look for fossils from that uh, particular place, and eventually he found uh, in all of the crates that were sent to him, uh, he found uh, uh, the first example of uh, human species, uh, Australopithecus africanus, uh, which is uh, a three-year-old. Uh, young human, and uh, we've learned so much from that, uh, that uh, tiny fossils. It, it, it's absolutely, it's stunning. We also learned the cause of death from that, uh, from that poor individual, because at, uh, in the forefront of, uh, of the skull, we see uh, uh, the talons of uh, an eagle that has just snatched it. Uh, we still see that kind of uh, behavior in short-winged uh, eagles in, uh, in, in South Africa, that they are snatching uh, uh, primates out of, uh, out of trees. And what we still, that behavior that we saw three million years ago, we still see, we still see that. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which makes that poor individual also special. Up there in the, in the right upper corner, uh, you see reconstructions of that skull. It's sold in the museum shop. Uh, all of them are hand cast, hand painted by locals, some uh, by, by children, So they, which means that they are all unique. If you ever visit that museum, I will encourage you to buy one of those because you're also supporting the local, uh, the local community. Um, this is 
Australopithecus sediba. One of uh, the reconstructions that I'd made uh, with uh, the Kennys brothers that, uh, that you heard about uh, earlier. Uh, it is a human species that we discovered just about 15 years ago, uh, new, uh, also in that area from the cradle of, uh, uh, of, uh, of humankind. And one of the things that is special about, uh, about Sadiba is that uh, we usually think, or the normally people think, that once humans started to walk on two legs, they stayed on two legs, they stayed on the ground. But in, in Sadiba, we find that uh, they were also adapted to living in the trees. So you could still be walking on two legs, you would still be part bipedal, but also having an, uh, an arboreal uh, existence. And looking at the dental calculus of uh, Sadiba, we've also found that uh, the last part of the diet of, uh, of Sadiba was from bark. So they were uh, eating uh, very rough, uh, rough foods. Um, and that could explain why, while being in the, in, up in tall trees, uh, uh, was not just for safety, as we often assume, but it was also for for feeding behavior. A lot of primates, uh, a lot of apes, they like honey. We can also see that a lot of uh, in a lot of fossils. We have uh, examples of carriers um, and uh, um, chimpanzees. They go hunting for honey. Uh, so this could is also likely that other primates uh, or other human species, so they've also, uh, also done that. But we did put in this, uh, in this uh, in introduction also that scene, because I, I so much wanted uh, uh, that, uh, that scene to get people to understand that at this time, humans were prey for, uh, and uh, we had predators preying on them. So even though it's from the evidence that we have is from another, another species, Australopithecus africanus, I did, I couldn't help uh, putting in, uh, when we were doing that exhibition for, for the Most Guard Museum, uh, that scene with the, uh, with the eagle and, uh, and the young tongue child. Uh, moving to Ethiopia uh, in Hadar, we, find, we have uh, the example of probably the most famous human fossil ever, uh, Lucy. Uh, also, Lepithecus afarensis, discovered in 1974 by, uh, codes discovered by Don Johansson. One of the, the most frightful moments in my career was uh, before opening that, uh, that museum in 2014, just a few weeks earlier, I met with Don Johansson, uh, who discovered uh, Lucy in Gibraltar, of, uh, of all places, and I was showing him uh, the image of uh, of Lucy, and uh, but luckily he was very, very happy about it. Uh, and I later got an opportunity of bringing him to uh, to Moscow Museum, and there he's sitting next door. Uh, and after a few minutes, eventually they got along very, very well. Um, I'll show you uh, an, a small video of uh, that also demonstrates the, uh, the, the world that we are recreating through uh, the fossil evidence, but also through all of that uh, ecological context we get from all the, other, uh, uh, all the other fossils that we're finding. Here, this is, uh, you, you'll see the leopard looking at the baboons over there in the, in the corner. And one hypothesis uh, why it was an advantage to stand on two legs was to, that you would get a better, uh, a better overview of the landscape and thus would be better, more able to, uh, to spot predators. You'll see the locust flying just next door, easy source of protein, and you'll see the baby up there in the tree. So this is a scene of uh, an Australopithecus uh, forensis protecting its baby from the predators and having that, that advantage over the baboons because she can overlook that, uh, uh, that scene. So we are using all of the evidence that we have available to recreate those, uh, 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 the worlds that they, uh, they lived in. Another example, uh, now we're moving a bit further, a bit further south to uh, Kenya and to Lake Turkana. 
uh, one of the poorest uh, uh, areas in uh, in Kenya, but an absolutely beautiful uh, landscape and very rich on uh, on fossils. Here we found one of also one of the most famous uh, human fossils, uh, the Tukana boy, uh, 1.5 million year old Homo erectus. Homo erectus is also a special uh, chapter in our evolutionary journey because here we have a body plan that's very similar to ours. We have a, a body that's perfectly easy. Um, um, the narrative that we were that we were building and so the kind of stories that we wanted to build in. So we have a very slender body, a body that is perfectly adapted to long distance running and to to throwing. Um, in uh, and so in Homo erectus, we also have some of the first evidence of uh, of uh, use of fire. It's Difficult to say exactly when the first use of fire uh, was. Uh, it was probably coming through uh, forest fires, ritual fires, uh, natural fires, and food that was, or animals that were trapped and cooked. We have we have examples of that uh, still uh, still happening. So that would be something that eventually led uh, humans to start eating uh, eating cooked food and using uh, using fire which gradually uh, changed our uh, all of our uh, uh, intestines uh, and which means and you're a specialist and uh, on the on this this uh, this particular field which means that we are actually uh, through using uh, uh, through eating cooked food over hundreds of thousands of, uh, of years, um, we are now unable to live exclusively on raw foods as, uh, as uh, chimpanzees they do. We do have a raw food uh, movement, but we st uh, and I'm sure that, uh, that you've heard of that, but we still need to have uh, food that is processed in one way or, uh, or the other. Our in, uh, all of our intestines, they are evolutionary no longer able to live on the same diet as uh, as chimpanzees are uh, are doing at this stage uh, uh, homo erectus they have they are also representing a shift where the australopithecines they were still uh, prey but now for, from the from Homo erectus and onwards, uh, humans are now also predators, and they are fighting for that uh, for a, a particular niche as uh, as as predator, fighting over uh, uh, over prey. Moving on to a, uh, a different place, Gibraltar. We are now. Uh, Famously here, seen from uh, from from the seaside, it's one of the last strongholds of uh, for Neanderthals. Um, they went extinct about four thousand years ago, and uh, some of the last evidence that we have of Neanderthal occupation is from uh, is from the, uh, from Gibraltar. They were uh, living using the marine resources uh, around them, and when we were doing the Moscow Museum in 2014. We had learned a lot about Neanderthals. Uh, Neanderthals that are our closest extinct relatives. Uh, we share a lot of genes with uh, Neanderthals. In fact, we've, we now have evidence of uh, interbreeding between humans like us and Neanderthals, uh, which means that uh, we are all sharing between the, uh, um, uh, zero and four percent Neanderthal DNA, the D DNA, uh, all of us, which is amazing uh, to to think of uh, that Neanderthals, who used to be that primitive evolutionary cousin that we were looking uh, uh, down at, uh, that we are now we, we know that we are now sharing genes uh, with with Neanderthals and with eight billion people on the planet, we uh, now have. Uh, ironically, more Neanderthal DNA uh, ever compared to any other time in uh, in human history. Uh, 
the Neanderthal populations were fairly small. They were living in small, uh, in small groups. Um, when we did the exhibition at the Moskard Museum, uh, we were changing, we were looking at some of the changes in the perception of Neanderthals, and a lot of, uh, a lot of things uh, were, were changed. Uh, they were still, there was still an image of, uh, of people who were living on, uh, uh, mostly on, uh, on meat, Mammoths, woolly, uh, rhinoceros, uh, sheep, uh, etc. The example that we were using was from Spee in, uh, in, in Belgium. But they were also uh, inventing new technologies. For instance, they, were, they could uh, create a very strong uh, glue to attach their uh, stone implements on, uh, on, on spears. Uh, that required an incredible skill. Neanderthals also had brains that were larger than, uh, than our, uh, our brains, so we know that they were very intelligent. They were also socially intelligent. Uh, they were, uh, some of them were burying the dead. They were using, uh, so they had a, a, a symbolic uh, exchange and understanding. Uh, they were using uh, beads uh, and uh, ornamental uh, flowers. Uh, all sorts of uh, things, but if I should do a new Neanderthal exhibit, I would also include uh, a more varied diet, because one of the things that we've learned is that uh, they were, just as we, as, as modern humans, uh, living on, uh, on whatever was provided in that environment. So our understanding of these uh, meat eaters is based on the, uh, on the archaeological findings that, uh, that we've had so far, but now we know we've seen new examples of Neanderthals uh, feeding on uh, a, a much more varied diet, plants, uh, mushrooms, marine resources from, from Gibraltar. We now know that uh, they were living very much from, uh, from uh, fish, from seal, from uh, dolphins, uh, from mussels, um, and in one cave uh, in the nor in north of Spain, uh, we have uh, uh, incredible evidence of, uh, of mushrooms, various plants, mosses that they were also feeding on. Uh, but we also found evidence from looking at the dental calculus uh, that uh, one had a very nasty, na nasty gastroparasite uh, that uh, we discovered in 1985 uh, from uh, looking at HIV uh, patients. Um, and this particular parasite, it causes chronic diarrhea, nausea, dizziness, all sorts of unpleasant things. And that, of course, was sad for that poor Neanderthal who lived 49,000 years ago. But what is really interesting is that we also, in the dental calculus, find evidence of uh, this individual eating uh, poplar bark, uh, and uh, uh, which is a natural source of salicylic uh, acids. Um, and we also found evidence in the dental calculus of this individual uh, eating penicillin mold, so probably from, uh, from mold, and, uh, mold and plant materials. So, so this person was either being medicated or self-medicating on, uh, on painkillers and antibiotics 49,000 years ago in a different human species. I think that is pretty cool. And that is something that we're just learning uh, uh, now. Uh, the moving to Morocco, Jebel Irut, this is the earliest example of uh, species of our own species, Homo sapiens. Um, we wanted to recreate that, and, and that was in 2014. Uh, we thought it was about 160,000 years old. A few years later, uh, new, uh, um, new studies were made of, that, uh, of those particular finds, uh, fossil finds, and we discovered that they were 300,000 years old. So that's the age of our species. We've been, as a species, living on this planet for 300,000 years, uh, uh, 300, years. And we 
in Homo sapiens, we see uh, a social structure very, uh, um, that is very similar to, uh, to Neanderthals in a certain number of, uh, of ways. But uh, compared to Neanderthals, they originated on the European Eurasian continent, uh, and we originated on the, the, African, uh, the African continent from a common ancestor called, uh, we, that we assume was a species called uh, Homo heidelbergensis. Um, again, as in Homo erectus, uh, Homo sapiens, they have turned into the top predators, uh, um, still competing with other uh, predators, as, uh, as you see here, but uh, the, all the, almost everything that we know about ourselves as a human species was already in place 300,000 years ago. When we look towards uh, the southern tip of, uh, of the African uh, continent of the Western Cape, we have some of the earliest examples of symbolic behavior uh, going back 160,000 years ago when uh, humans, they were beginning to use uh, small shells uh, as beads and ornamental using ochre and having an ochre pr uh, production. Um, one example is from the Blombos uh, caves, uh, the, where we see the oldest human drawing there in the, the, uh, uh, the right uh, right hand uh, corner it's 73,000 years uh, years old that you see that very geometric pattern uh, that we see see over there uh, we have an example uh, from Neanderthals about 40,000 uh, years years ago from uh, the caves in Gibraltar but what is interesting when we look at that geometric uh, pattern we have another example uh, that's is 450,000 years old uh, from Homo erectus doing almost exactly the same thing. So when we see that what we, our own species, were capable of doing, this is the earliest evidence that we have of what you could say an artistic representation from, uh, from humans. We had another human species who were doing the same thing almost 400,000 years uh, uh, earlier. The upper... Uh, Right-hand corner is a, a tool set from ochre production. So in this, and here you see some ostrich shells that also have that kind of, uh, of geometric pattern. And that tool set uh, was for producing ochre. Uh, when we look at, uh, at the use of ochre still today in, uh, in the, uh, the south of, uh, of Africa, it's used as uh, um, um, ornamental uh, um, uh, display um, and also for as uh, um, sunscreen uh, sun protection and insect insect repellent and when we're seeing how sophisticated the ochre production was already 70, 73,000 years old uh, it's it's clear to us that uh, that humans were already knowing of, uh, of uh, the effects of protecting, uh, protecting yourself. An odd thing happened uh, about 20 years ago when uh, in the tiny island of uh, Flores in Indonesia, uh, in this beautiful cage, absolutely stunning, the Liangbua uh, uh, cave, uh, researchers, they found a new, hum a new human species, very small, about a meter tall, big feet, just around the time when the last of uh, the Lord of the Rings uh, uh, film came. So, of course, it was uh, immediately nicknamed the Hobbit. Uh, its, its scientific name is Homo floresiensis. It lives, it lives on, in these, these islands just around uh, Flores, and it's a different kind of world. We still have Komodo dragons. They also lived 60,000 years ago. Uh, when uh, Homo floresiensis, they, uh, they lived there. It's a very dramatic uh, uh, landscape with uh, lots of volcanoes, uh, lots of volcanic uh, activities. Some of it is barren and some is incredibly, uh, incredibly lush. In that uh, time when the Homo floresiensis lived uh, on the, 
on, on Floris. It was also a different world with giant storks. We have evidence of a stork that was two meters, standing two meters tall. We have pygmy elephants, we have giant, uh, giant rats, that, and uh, we, we have evidence that Homo floresiensis were eating on those, uh, were eating those, hunting those giant rats and, uh, and, and eating them. Extraordinary. They're still, they're still present on uh, the island of uh, Flores. Some of the locals, they still uh, eat them. I passed on it when uh, they caught one next door to the cave and uh, they were preparing it. Uh, but uh, they, they still, still seem to, to love it. In that cave, uh, the, um, uh, the Liang Boer cave, it's also interesting uh, that uh, we, we have evidence of uh, Homo floresiensis about to about 60,000 years uh, ago. Uh, a few thousand years later, we have evidence of uh, occupation for, by Homo sapiens, our own species. So just a few thousand years separating. In evolutionary terms, it's like meeting each other in the supermarket or at the hospital. Um, um, and this gives us an indication, an indirect evidence that maybe uh, uh, our own species have been part of that uh, extinction story that uh, we've seen with other humans, with uh, a lot of megafauna, when the humans they were traveling around uh, the world. And this is exactly what happened. Now, we, we, we don't see any of all of the migrations, uh, but uh, hopefully you'll get a sense of, uh, of a number of different human species spreading uh, across the globe. Homo erectus was the first one to leave the African continent but Homo sapiens, the most successful, that eventually uh, uh, lived and occupied uh, all, uh, all of the continents, the last continent to conquer, except uh, um, with the exception of the, the Antarctica, was uh, South America. One example is in Brazil, in, the, in Lagoa, uh, Lagoa Santa, where we have evidence of, uh, of human occupation about 10,000 years. Uh, 10,000 years ago in those marvelous uh, limestone caves uh, where a Danish explorer in uh, the 1830s uh, went and collected a lot of fossils, uh, extinct, now extinct megafauna, brought all of that back to, uh, to Copenhagen. Um, so we have uh, most of that evidence in, the, in our collections. What was also interesting that was that he found some human uh, human skulls in those uh, in those caves, which at the time was the earliest evidence of uh, of human occupation in uh, in South America, about uh, a bit more than ten thousand years old. They lived in these uh, in these caves, and you'll see some of the cave art that's uh, up there in the right hand corner and the, in the left hand corner. Um, they were living. There's a sixty meter drop just outside that window in the middle. Of the, in the middle of the uh, image. And on the outer wall, you will also see, uh, you'll see uh, rock, uh, rock paintings. I got dizzy just standing with my back against, uh, um, against, uh, against the wall of that, uh, of that rock. I cannot imagine the courage it must have taken to climb on the outer side and then uh, and then do uh, do uh, rock paintings, but we find we find all of that evidence. So that their devil scenery that we is so familiar that I'm sure that you see a lot of uh, a lot of evidence of this at uh, at, uh, at, at hospitals like uh, uh, like this was already going on about uh, ten thousand years ago. People, humans, have been showing off for tens, for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, there's, uh, there's no no doubt, no doubt about that. In the last, after coming down into the South Americas, the last place to populate was uh, the, uh, uh, the small, very isolated islands in the, in the Pacific, and one of the last places uh, for humans to, to go was uh, the Hawaiian Islands. That happened just 
about 900 to about to a thousand years old, uh, to a thousand years ago, um, in those extraordinary, uh, beautiful, also very, uh, very different uh, islands, all of a vol uh, volcanic uh, origin, uh, populated by Polynesian travelers who were able to travel uh, thousands and thousands of miles overland. But at that, at that stage, humans, when traveling, they were traveling with an, a perfect evolutionary pack. They were bringing uh, their worlds with them. That also happened in the, uh, when the Hawaiian islands were, uh, were populated. Um, the, the, the travelers were bringing what is now known as canoe plants, about 15 different species that they brought to these uh, islands. Uh, they started growing uh, the plants immediately. Uh, some were for eating, some were for uh, ornamental, uh, ornamental use. They were also using, uh, bringing a few domesticated animals, uh, especially chickens, pigs, inevitably, always, and uh, not on purpose, rats. Um, and as you would know, viruses, parasites, bacteria, and this is what we do this, to these, and that's what happened to these pristine uh, islands about a thousand, a thousand years ago. Uh, also, a lot of indigenous uh, uh, medical uh, uh, knowledge of uh, medical uh, plants and, and uses of, uh, uh, of that. Again, we see a lot of symbolic uh, representation on the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, um, using those volcanic uh, vol volcanic rocks um, as a way of expressing um, symbolic meaning of uh, various sorts, sometimes warning, sometimes uh, uh, storytelling. In the upper right corner, you'll also see a shelter that was used for uh, sheltering from uh, the very harsh weather uh, that. Uh, uh, sometimes occurs on the Hawaiian uh, islands, and you'll see all of the inscriptions uh, around it. By then, these were modern humans. They were doing uh, what modern humans were doing. They were not just adapting to the world that they uh, they were living in, but they were also adapting uh, the, the world to uh, to their uh, to their needs. This is what has happened uh, over uh, um, the, the past tens tens of thousands of, uh, of years that we have been changing our environment as species. Uh, and it's, it gives a different framework to trying to understand what we are doing, what we're currently doing as, uh, as humans today when we have that entire evolutionary history that uh, makes sense of why we behave uh, the way we do, why we act the way we uh, uh, we do today when since the settlement of uh, the Hawaiian Islands, uh, we have seen an acceleration of human population around the world uh, from the 1500s with the uh, European settlements uh, and colonization of the world, accelerating through the industrialization over the past 200 years. So now we are occupying the entire, uh, the entire planet and when we talk about human nature, it's no longer just our nature, but it's also how we have made nature human. This is an example from a forest in Sweden. Uh, we have uh, evidence of, uh, of uh, human activity everywhere on, the, on this planet. Uh, only about 3% of, uh, of the planet is untouched by humans. We find uh, microplastic everywhere. It's uh, uh, in the penguins of the Antarctica. It's uh, in the deep oceanic trenches. It's on the top of the mountains. We find we have it in our bloodstreams. We have it uh, um, in, even in uh, breast milk that uh, we're feeding our, uh, our babies. Um, we can cover the entire earth with uh, uh, all the concrete that, uh, that we have produced with a layer, a thin layer, about a th half a centimeter thick, but the entire planet we can cover uh, in, in concrete. We are beginning to 
understand what we're doing to uh, to this planet. We're beginning to understand the consequences for for the planet. But I think we're still we don't know the consequences for our for our, for us. What are the consequences of this? And I think we being an incredibly selfish uh, species. I think we should, if we want to help the, uh, the the planet, if we want to change the course that we're currently on, maybe we should use against that superpower of uh, of looking at uh, at ourselves, looking at at each other. What is what are the our actions actually doing to to us? What are the our actions actually doing to human health? Uh, we still don't know what it means to have all of that microplastic floating around in our in our bodies in 10, 20, 30 years. Maybe we will know. Um, hopefully, we're relying on you for for that matter. And we also need to have a conversation about uh, about this. And one of the places where we can have these conversations are at museums. Uh, they are spaces where we bring people together. We are building a new museum in uh, in Copenhagen. In the old botanic garden just next door to the uh, to the greenhouses. Uh, it's a huge project using some of the old historical listed buildings and digging very deep down 15 meters into the ground to create all new galleries to tell part of that story that uh, I've been telling you about. A story that's about a planet that's in that's been four and a half billion years in the making and is still uh, and is still in the making, and where we now, as humans, act as a natural force on that uh, on that planet. It's well underway. The, for you, pulled off the a visit from the American ambassador to uh, to Denmark, uh, who has a great interest in uh, in in construction. There's a lot of concrete here. Uh, a bit too much for my taste, actually. Um, but, uh, but hopefully we'll use this to tell that uh, to tell that story, that uh, powerful story of uh, uh, our uh, our place in the, in nature, and uh, hopefully also to build a platform for engaging as ma as many people as possible across differences to uh, try to make this world a better place. It needs it. We need it. Thank you very much. Yes, so Do you believe that there is somebody like you who goes in the in the earth and works in this world? Yes, so the, the question is, are we still evolving? Yes. And I think inevitably we are evolving. Uh, this, we've we've used to think about ourselves as the end stage, as uh, the evolutionary stop. We, that we are the purpose of uh, of everything, but I think with all of the changes that we are that we are seeing, all the things that we're doing to the planet, that we're also doing that to, doing to, to us, we have to adapt. Um, we have to find ways of, uh, of of adapting to the all the environmental stresses that we are that we are currently uh, putting ourselves uh, ourselves through. And we when we look at uh, adaptation to uh, to drinking milk, for instance, that happened very early, uh, or very, very recent. Um, different skin colors also happened very, uh, very recently. Uh, the fair skin only, only appeared about between six to 12,000 years ago. So it's, in evolutionary terms, that's, uh, that's very recent. Uh, and we still see changes, we still see adaptations. I think uh, our biggest worry should be whether or not we're going extinct. That's a brilliant question, and of course I should have anticipated that question. The earliest, 
the earliest evidence that we have of uh, of stone tools is uh, 3.6 million years uh, years ago. Uh, but for the the earliest evidence that uh, that that I know of of uh, medication and self medication uh, is from that Neanderthal site uh, 49,000 years ago. But it's something that we've only discovered recently, and now we've we have new technologies, new tools for looking at that. So I'd be interested in in looking at, for instance, down some calculus at some of the other human species to see what did they what did they know? No, did they did they do the same same kind of self medication? Because when we look at uh, chimpanzees, for instance, they are self medicating. Uh, they they have a knowledge of medicinal plants. So if they are doing it, that's, there's a likelihood that our ancestors, seven million years ago, that they would also have a, a knowledge of uh, medicinal plants. Uh, but it's a wonderful research question, uh, and it would be a wonderful joint program. We need people like you to be part of, uh, of such a project. It's, it's very so the question is about uh, the origins of language and it's very difficult to have uh, direct evidence of, uh, of, of language language and usually we've been thinking that we need to have uh, written language uh, in order to say that this is direct uh, the direct evidence but for most of us the, uh, the the social structures the very complicated social structures that we can see from the evidence that these uh, early humans that they that they had that required uh, a, 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 com a complicated uh, or an advanced form of communication. Um, and so from my perspective, it would be impossible to think of that uh, Homo erectus, for instance, were able to have that kind of social hunting that we, we, we know that uh, they, they did if they didn't have an advanced form of communication, that would be a kind of similar to, uh, to, to language. Uh, we also see that from the symbolic, uh, um, the evidence of symbolic behavior uh, that goes back 450,000 years in Homo erectus with that geometric, uh, geometric pattern. We see, but communication is, is different and looking at it as a language that's, uh, that's like we, we speak with an advanced grammar, etc. It's not perhaps not necessary in order to have advanced communication. We also see in some primate species uh, monkeys that uh, uh, are distantly related to us, and they have very advanced communication forms, and they can actually have they can communicate between different species. Warning against, for instance, as you would know now, is useful. An eagle coming in to, uh, through the tree. There's a special sound for uh, for that. So you think again, it's 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 not an either or. Either you have language or you don't. Uh, there's a uh, there's a um, uh, a, a, um, a spectrum, thank you, a spectrum of, uh, of, of advanced communication, and, uh, but impossible to think that uh, they would have, early humans would have had that advanced social behavior without having an advanced communication. But it's difficult to get hold of. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, sir. thank you. The question is about repatriation. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of efforts of, of doing that. The Ethiopian uh, example, for instance, uh, all the Ethiopian fossils are in Ethiopia and are studied in uh, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, same thing with the uh, with most of the uh, the evidence from from Kenya. Earlier, the 
things were brought to either North America or to European museum collections or universities, uh, and uh, and many of uh, many of those collections are still in Europe and uh, and in North America. So, from a museum perspective, what uh, what matters to us is that we make our collections available to uh, to everyone. That we see this as a shared world heritage. This is this, this represents all of our shared. Uh, shared human history and uh, and we need to make this available for everyone we can do that through uh, opening access to our collections but also if you're not able to travel and very few people are and we should travel less uh, we can make things available for, in a digital format um, and a lot of museums including our museum in Copenhagen are did part of uh, part of a large project digitizing our collections uh, so in, the, in that sense we can digitally repatriate things, make make these available, uh, all these uh, fossils to uh, students and teachers, researchers, and to everyone uh, around the world. I think this is this is something that we have to do together. But it's a it's a it's a complicated uh, complicated story and a complicated complicated question. The main message is that this belongs to everyone, and we should make it available to everyone. Yes. So, so the question is, how how actually to make this a better world? How to how to Im how to improve on on things? And I think most of us we we are left with that feeling that it's it's impossible. We can't do anything. I mean, this is these are so massive systemic changes that uh, that we uh, that we as individuals we don't matter at all. And I think that that there are two two key messages for me. One is that every single individual matters. Uh, and I think that's the most empowering message that you can give to anyone, especially especially young children. Uh, we see that in young children, uh, children and young adults uh, growing up with that sense of uh, desolation that uh, it's, uh, it, it, does matter. it does matter. I, I don't matter. My, my life is insignificant, and it isn't. We have to, to insist on making a difference, and I have uh, lots of examples. We have lots of examples where we've found uh, individuals, even children, who can go out and make a difference, start a movement. And you can start. You can start locally. You can start talking to your to your parents, to your local community. You can uh, uh, get get a group, uh, get a group together. And uh, and whatever you do, if you're doing something, it matters. We are eight billion people, and counting. And if all of us, or it's just half of us, or just 10% of us, we start doing something, that matters. That's uh, that is a, that's a massive uh, that's a massive movement, and that's to my second uh, point. I think what you can do is that you can you can influence uh, the the big systems. And what are the big systems? They well, they are regulated uh, at least in part by. Uh, by politicians, so you can vote.
yes, we do, we do have uh, evidence of other, uh, other species. Uh, and fairly elusive species called the uh, Denisovans, uh, discovered from the DNA in just a, uh, a fragment of a finger bone. Uh, we've discovered that, uh, especially the uh, Asian population, that they have uh, up to about 4 or 5% of uh, Denisovan DNA uh, uh, as well. We also have some evidence of a species that uh, we are not entirely certain of what actually uh, what actually is. It requires us to get the DNA of that species, uh, but we can just see that there's a, a kind of a ghost species that has been somehow inbreeding uh, uh, with uh, uh, with with Homo sapiens. That has there's a genetic residue of another uh, of another species. It, all of this, of course, challenges our species concepts. And a lot of us, some of us, grew up on uh, uh, species concepts that uh, species were natural classes uh, that uh, couldn't, that were completely isolated. But what we're seeing uh, with Neanderthals and humans and, uh, and Denisovans is that uh, there's a lot of hybridization. And we've been keeping humans sort of safe from that hyper, uh, that uh, thought of, uh, of, of hybrids, but we're seeing that in all the rest of, uh, of, the, animal, uh, of the animal kingdom, lots and lots of hybrids. And uh, from, from our perspective now, what we're seeing is that uh, humans are not as special as uh, compared to other animals, that they are just like other animals, that they are they're breeding with closely related species, and uh, we're getting we're seeing hybrids. So maybe we'll see we'll see more uh, more species coming out of it. Uh, I'm sure what we've learned over the past 10, 15 years uh, by looking into ancient DNA, I cannot imagine what we'll learn for, for the next 10, 15 years. Quite a lot. This talk will be very different, I'm sure. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.